We're going to begin talking about gears today. And so the specific thing that I have on the agenda today is to kind of discuss some of the um, you know, aspects of gears that have to do with their geometry. And then when we meet next time and maybe the time after that, we'll start looking at issues surrounding the uh, more like the types of stress and whatnot that, that gears carry. So we'll kind of make those our two different aspects that we look at. Um, I know there's a lot going on the screen right now, um, so let's kind of talk through some of it just a little bit. And so I guess I just want to kind of talk through how gears mate with one another, because there's, you know, it's an interesting thing that up till now in your other classes where you've done gears, it's likely that uh, we've kind of just ignored the fact that there are teeth on the gears and we've just kind of pretended like they were drums that were rolling against each other. Well, that's not really wrong. You can actually model them that way for certain uh, types of questions that you're trying to ask. But at some point, you do sometimes have to get all the way down to the level of thinking about the actual shape of the gear teeth and all that. So where I want to start is with the idea of what shape a gear tooth actually is. And uh, this is a, you know, it's probably an easier thing to demonstrate if I was actually on a chalkboard. It's harder for me to do it in the format that we're in right now. But the shape of a gear tooth uses a curve that's called an involute curve. An involute curve, we actually have a, an example of that up here. See this little involute curve right here? Um, the way you generate an involute curve is you imagine wrapping a piece of string uh, around some circle. And actually, you might see here that there's a circle here called the base circle. That base circle is what is used to generate the shape of these involute curves. So what you do is you think about wrapping a string around that base circle. So I'm going to do that right up to this involute curve. So I'm going to wrap the, this string around here. You wrap a string around here, and you stop it right at the base of this involute curve. And then imagine tying the tip of a pencil right to the end of that string. Okay. I think you're, you're on a piece of paper now, and I've, I've wrapped this string around the base circle. And now, what I do is now that my pencil is attached to the end of this string, right at that point, I start unwrapping the string. Okay? So if I unwrap a little ways, the string will actually unwrap maybe back to here, and that'll generate this point. If I unwrap a little bit further, the string might unwrap back to here, and that'll generate that point. Okay, does that make sense? Um, it turns out that this is the shape of curve that causes these um, teeth of the gears to mate in a certain way. And uh, this matters to us because it, it causes a very smooth uh, transfer of torque from one gear to the other gear. All right, there are other shapes of teeth that work, but nothing works as well as this shape. And here's why. Um, you might see here that we have this pressure line all right, see that pressure line that we have right there? Um, the shape of an involute curve is what makes the contact point as, as the teeth of gears mate with one another. It makes that contact point basically progress along a straight line. And that straight line is, is going to be on this sloped angle like this. Um, and uh, by doing this, it basically makes a a really smooth transition of, or transmission of torque from one gear to the other gear. So right as one tooth for perhaps starts to leave, right, say so this tooth up here starts to leave contact with the other one, you've probably already had contact begin to engage on the other end. And so there's a period of time where there's actually two teeth or sometimes even more teeth than two uh, carrying that transmission of torque um, at any given point in time. As a matter of fact, if you don't have at least um, a little tiny bit of overlap of those, then you're going to end up having gears that don't, um, you know, they're going to probably not transmit that torque very smoothly, as you might guess, right? So you have to have a little bit of overlap there. And that is actually something that's called a contact ratio. So if you have a contact ratio of one, then it means the average, if you'd kind of average over time, how many teeth are touching each other at any point in time, a contact ratio of one says that on average, you've always got one tooth touching. If you have a contact ratio of like 1.2, then that kind of basically means you, you know, in rough terms, 20% of the time you've got two teeth 
touching, whereas that's not really what it means. But you get the idea that there's basically um, a period of time where there's going to be overlap in the teeth. And if you have a contact ratio of more than two, then it means you always have two teeth, at least two teeth touching. Okay. Um, one of the things that happens here is that right when the tooth uh, begins to make its contact, the forces that are applied to the tooth end up right on the tip of the tooth, right? But as the tooth moves through its contact, the contact moves further and further, further to the, to the base of the tooth. What do you think that does to stresses in the teeth? Like if you're way on the tip, is that better or worse? That's worse in terms of stress, typically, for the tooth, at least for the bending stresses that we have in the tooth. The other type of stress we're going to look at is uh, contact stress. So that, that one doesn't care so much. But as far as bending, the further out on the tooth you are, um, the worse it is. But then through some of the range of motion, it moves inward and, uh, and goes closer to the base. Okay. Um, another thing that I'll show you here is that the shape of the of the tooth is only in volute up to the point where it hits the base circle. All right, so right up to the point where it hits the base circle right there, it keeps its in volute shape, but then there is actually a certain amount of undercut, or not, it's not undercut, it's, um, it's called dedendum, all right? It basically gives you a little bit of, of uh, material that's cut out and it gives enough space for the tip of the tooth that is no longer actually involved in contact it gives space for the tip of that tooth to just sort of move without touching anything by having the little bottom of that place carved out. And you might see, uh, let's see, which picture is it on? It says fillet radius right here, right? Actually, they make those such that they have a fillet at the base. Why do you think they do that? You want to avoid stress concentration as much as possible. So there's a lot of kind of detail that goes into the, you know, the shaping of these teeth. And I kind of wanted to mention some of that. Um, you know, the, there is also this addendum circle, which basically shows you how far do you go with your involute curve before you stop, right? And that's kind of uh, set up with this addendum circle. So these are all interesting things. The one that we have used a lot up till now, and the one that we need to keep remembering exists, is this one that's called a pitch circle, okay? The pitch circle is the circle that the gears behave as, as if that is the drum size. If, it, if one was a drum and the other one was a drum and they were just rubbing against each other with friction, it would be like you would have the pitch circle mating with the pitch circle at, right at the uh, tangential point, right where those two would mate. Um, and this is interesting because this also defines where the uh, point is, right where that line, uh, the pressure line moves through you know, this contact, it intersects right at that pitch point. That's what that big P is right there, is the pitch point. Uh, we also have these angles, the angle of approach and the angle of recess, okay? And that basically gives you uh, an idea of where uh, the edge of the tooth is when it starts to come into this uh, contact as opposed to where it is once it begin, where it, once the teeth leave contact. Does that make sense? So it's kind of got this uh, angle of approach and angle of recess that define where contact begins and ends between uh, mating teeth. All right, I kind of wanted to just go through these. Um, I do have one uh, homework assignment for you to do uh, that has to do with trying to specify some of the parameters that go into the gear mating. Um, I think it's relatively simple to figure out, even though it is a, a little bit of geometry to do. I wanted to bring up, though, some of these, um, kind of this terminology before we get into the actual problem that I'm going to work today, which uh, has a little bit less to do with the specifics of how these gear teeth are formed. So let's actually move into that. The other aspect of gear geometry has to do with how do you use gears to get particular um, ratios that you might want in terms of an input, input speed versus output speed and that kind of thing. Okay, So here's the little problem that we're going to solve. We have uh, gears A and B. They mate with one another. Okay, um, And then there's a shaft that goes from, bear, from gear B 
through this little carrier, I don't have that labeled right there, but let's say that this is a carrier. Okay. And there's a bearing in that carrier that allows the shaft that connects gears B and C, it allows it to turn freely in that uh, zone. Okay. And that carrier then is connected solidly into this shaft that comes out at point D. Okay. So we, uh, we have you know, kind of rigid bearings here that are keeping everything from twisting. So these are not uh, spherically articulating bearings. So it means that this shaft coming from D is held to where it's, you know, in the line that it's going to be. Um, it, it's not allowed to articulate around anywhere. Okay. Um, the way to understand this is that gear C then uh, mates with a ring gear, and that's a really hard thing to draw in this plane where I'm drawing these gears. And so I drew an, another view down here where we have this ring gear. So this ring is what I'm drawing right here. You see this is kind of a section view of that ring. Okay, this is a type of gear train that's called an epicyclic gear train. Uh, it basically, or sometimes you might see it called a planetary gear train, although this one's not just simple planets because we have a different size of a planet uh, on one end of this shaft as opposed to the other end that's mating with the ring gear. Okay. So gears A and C have 29 teeth. All right. Uh, gear C is running in a stationary ring gear. The diametral pitch of all gears is two and a half. Okay. And I have a note up here. You'll see this terminology a lot where they say the diametral pitch of a gear is, and then just put a number. If, if that's what you see, then the units of that number are in teeth per inch. Okay. And when you say teeth per inch, the next question to ask is always inches of what? Okay. Teeth per inch of what? All right. Because there's two different kinds of pitch that we can talk about here, at least two different kinds of pitch. Uh, one of them is called diametral pitch. Okay. And when you're dealing with diametral pitch, what do you think you are measuring inches of? Diameter, Diameter right? Um, there's, the other one that you can use is called circumferential pitch. Okay. And if you're dealing with uh, gears that where you know the circumferential pitch, then it means that you're dealing with a number of teeth per unit of circumference. And those are both, both for both of those, the diameter, diametral pitch or the circumferential pitch, you're talking about diameter or circumference of the pitch circle as opposed to any of these other circles that we saw on the geometry of the gear just a second ago. Okay. Um, we're going to use pressure angles uh, that are all 20 degrees. Okay. And you might remember back, we did a few problems earlier where we used uh, pressure angles where gears mated with each other. Um, thing to say about that is that the pressure angle is, is basically set by the geometry of the gear teeth. So if you cut the gear teeth differently, you can change what that angle is for the pressure line. Okay. So where we talk about the pressure angle, what we're talking about is this angle right here. Okay. And what I'm telling you here is that we're using gears that have teeth that are cut such that we have 20 degree pressure angle. Um, just as a matter of interest, in case you're curious, there aren't that many different types of, stand of gear standards that are out there as far as these pressure angles go. Um, what you will normally see is that you will either have one that's a 14 and a half degree. Okay. That's kind of an old standard. Although it is still, I mean, you can still get gears, no problem with that standard. Okay. These days, most gears that you see are 20 degrees. But then there is also another standard that is 25 degree. Okay. But there's not that many different kinds of pressure angles that are out there for these gears. And so if you kind of start seeing these, uh, you know, so a common number here that always pops up. It's because there are some standards out there that, um, you know, these gear teeth are made according to those standards. Very seldom does someone go off on their own and try to design their own standard as far as how gears are going to mate with one another. All right. 
uh, the teeth that we do are going to be full depth. So that actually brings up another thing in that we have uh, a couple of different standards within the idea of there being a, you know, 14 and a half or 20 degree or 25. Another thing that you can do is use either what's called full depth teeth or another standard is called stub teeth. Okay, what do you think the advantage is of stub teeth? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of the one of the advantages is if you don't need that much penetration between the the teeth, um, you can kind of fit them in into more compact spaces. Um, there's also some, you know, the gear tooth action. You won't have to have as much of it per tooth. You know, so there's a lot of there are a few advantages for stub teeth versus full depth teeth. But anyway, these are two different standards that are out there. Um, either stub teeth or full depth, and we're going to specify that we're going to use full depth teeth. Okay. And what we want to do here first is figure out what is the smallest number of teeth that we can use so that uh, for, for gear B, so that we can avoid undercut. Let me tell you why this is an interesting question. Okay. Uh, first of all, what is undercut? All right. Well, it turns out that when, once the gears mate with one another, if you make the gears too small, then the gear teeth themselves will actually want to start to occupy, let's say, you know, let's say that this is the, the portion of this tooth that is in volute. Um, after that has happened, if you make a gear too small, then there is a space underneath this gear tooth that the tip of the mating gear is going to want to occupy. And this effect gets worse and worse and worse as you make a gear smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. And so there is kind of a minimum size and it's, you know, this would have to happen on both sides of the tooth. All right. So if your gear tooth is too small, you can end up putting kind of a waste, you know, right here in your gear and that's called undercut. Okay. Do you think that's desirable? Yeah, that's not something that we would prefer to have if we can avoid it. Um, it weakens your teeth significantly if you start having undercut. Okay, so you want to avoid that. And so the first thing we need to do here is to figure out the smaller num smallest number of teeth that we can use so that we can avoid undercut. And um, one of the reasons I bring that out for a problem like this is that there's often, for a designer, there's often an interest in trying to make a gear train as compact as possible. Okay. And usually there's going to be the size of one of your gears, at least one of your gears in your gear train that is going to, you won't be able to go any smaller than some size. Right. And that ends up driving the sizes of other things that are in your gear train. And so we're going to see an example of that with this problem right here, because once we find that smallest number of teeth so that we can avoid undercut, and since we have already specified we want to use 29 teeth for gears uh, A and C, now that allows us to set um, things like the number of teeth for the ring gear. You might see that coming up here in just a minute. Okay. The other thing we'll have to set is the resulting center distance between axes AD and BC. All right, so this is what we're going to get into. I see some of you looking kind of funny at the picture up here. I think maybe some of you are trying to figure out what's still what's going on with this uh, gear train. It is a little bit of a hard thing to, um, to visualize. Let me actually try to use color a little bit better here. Um, uh, let's see, I won't use that color. I'll use green right here. So this gear right here is this green one right here. Okay. It is then mating with this uh, littler part of the, this pair of gears that is uh, attached via a shaft through that little carrier. Okay, And so that other part, C, is also part of that. And uh, I suppose if you were looking at this from the front, then you probably wouldn't see this little you know, part right there. That would be obscured by the, the sun. All right, and then gear C then is mating with the ring gear that's on the outside. The other thing that you can call a ring gear is an internally cut gear. So instead of having teeth that poke 
uh, outward, right, radially outward, there it's actually cut so that the teeth point inward, and so that's what the gear C is mating with. All right, does that help clear it up a little bit? All right, so let's get into it and find this smallest number of teeth that B can have so that we avoid undercut. Um, if you'll look on page 678, you will find an expression here that tells us that we have N sub P. Okay, so this is equation 1311. N sub P is going to be equal to this big thing, 2K. That's not 2,000. That's a parameter K we'll talk about in just a second. Um, over 1 plus 2M. It's another parameter we'll talk about here in a second. Sine squared of the pressure angle times M plus the square root of M squared plus 1 plus 2m sine squared of phi, which is, again, the pressure angle. Okay? So for this expression right here, uh, first thing we need to do is uh, kind of figure out what this k is. Uh, just a little bit above where that equation appears in the book, there's a sentence that says k equals 1 for full depth teeth and k equal 0.8 for stub teeth. Okay, So uh, right there you see an advantage for stub teeth in that uh, it should end up making a smaller minimum number of teeth in certain cases if you can use stub teeth. Right? So uh, for us, we have full depth teeth, so k is equal to 1. All right, the next one to look for is uh, M. All right. Um, M is a gear ratio. Okay. So I'm not, I don't necessarily love that letter for gear ratio, but that's what they use, and so that's what I've copied up here. Um, what M actually then becomes is the ratio of the number of teeth on the gear versus the number of teeth on the pinion. Okay, so M N sub G is equal to M sub G over N sub P. This right here is a pinion. Okay, so that kind of brings up what's a pinion versus a gear. Well, typically, uh, if you have uh, sort of two gears that mate in standard fashion, you look at the small, smaller one, if it's a relatively small gear, you usually call it a pinion. And if it's bigger, you usually call it a gear. Okay, so the one that's, that's smaller is often called the pinion as opposed to the bigger one, which is called the gear. Um, and so what we're gonna do here is notice that M is actually a function of N sub P. Right? So that's kind of annoying, and that means that we have to build this whole thing um, in terms of N sub P, why is that? Yeah, because, um, you know, that gear ratio, we are, since we've set the gear, number of gear teeth for one side, uh, then we don't know the number of teeth for the other side, so we don't know the gear ratio for this particular, we haven't set that yet. But we can set this all up in terms of that value. So let me do that. N sub P then ends up being... 2 times 1 over 1 plus, okay, the uh, number of teeth on the gear was what? 29. 29 teeth, okay, over N sub P. <clears throat> Did I forget a 2? Yep, thank you. 2 right there, appreciate that. Sine squared of... Okay, we have a pressure angle of 20 degrees. And this will all be multiplied by uh, 29 over, again, N sub P, uh, plus the square root of 
uh, m squared plus 1 plus m, or excuse me, 1 plus 2m times the sine squared of phi. Okay, and that would be a big old pain for us to evaluate if we were trying to do it uh, old school, right, if you didn't have nice tools to use. But if you have a calculator, it's not that hard to do, okay? So punching in the values here, I end up getting 14.2 teeth. Okay, the reason you know k is equal to 1, uh, the question was why, how do you know k is equal to 1? The reason you know that is that up here, it was one of our a priori design decisions. We were going to use this full depth type of a tooth. And uh, on page 678, uh, just a few lines above where we got this equation, it gives you the guidance that k is equal to 1 for full depth teeth and 0.8 for stub teeth. All right. So that calculates to be 14.2. So here's my question. Can you have a 14.2 tooth gear? No. Why not? Yeah, so it has to be, it has, you got to round to something that's a, an integer, right? Or else it won't work. So um, what do you think, which direction should we round? Uh, up, okay, so the suggestion is up. Why do we suggest that? Okay, yeah, as soon as you go anything less than this threshold that we just found, you start getting undercut, and you're trying to avoid undercut, right? So we're going to say use 15 teeth. At least, okay? Now, I want to give you one other thing here real quick. Uh, this is what we are going to use for this problem, but I want to also kind of temper this little analysis that we just did regarding the minimum number of teeth and say that very often uh, when you have a manufacturer that's producing gears, they may be producing those gears with something that's called a rack cutter, okay? What a rack cutter does is it's like, you know what a, do you know what a rack is in terms of a machine part? Okay, so a rack is like, it's like a gear, but it's, it's just a linear gear. It's actually kind of equivalent, if you think about it, to an infinitely, an infinite diameter gear, right? It's just like a straight line, it's got these straight teeth on it. If it's an infinitely long uh, rack, right, an infinitely big diameter gear, then your involute curves start to limit out to lines. They, they are no longer curved anymore, they just become straight lines, okay? So racks are actually pretty easy to understand. They just have these straight line cuts in them. Well, what you can do to build gears is you can actually make a cutter that's the shape of a rack and then use that cutter to cut a round piece that you then rotate as you cut. Okay, so that's one of the ways you can do it. If you use a rack-shaped cutter, then you will naturally generate the kind of undercut in your gear uh, because you have a rack-shaped cutter, you'll naturally develop the kind of undercut that would be, that, you know, that would exist for a racked shape, right? Which would be kind of like the um, gear ratio there, G over P, right? What would that ratio become for a rack? Okay, it becomes infinite, right? So anyway, the, the expression that you have there, it starts limiting out um, and it becomes something else if you go up to a, a rack. And so they actually give you um, a, another expression here, 1313, uh, equation 1313, allows you to simplify this expression uh, immensely if you are going to mate your gears with a rack. And that's actually a lot of times the way that these gears are made, even if you know that you're going to be mating it with something that's not a rack, okay? So we're going to keep this but it's possible that, that um, you, know, you might end up with a larger number there if you, have to, if you specify that it needs to be able to mate with a rack 
uh, and not just with the gear that you have sized for, for the particular application particular application that you are using. All right, so we're going to use 15 teeth. So what? What do we do with that? OK. So what we need to do is um, we need to find the resulting center distance between axes AD and BC. OK. Well, we can do that using the diametral pitch that we've specified for these gears. So if we have a two and a half diametral pitch, okay, 2.5 is equal to teeth per inch of diameter. Okay, so how do I figure out my size of my diameter? Okay, yeah, so, you know, lowercase d sub p is um, what we a lot of times use for pitch diameter. Okay, and uh, what we do to get that is we take our number of teeth, 15 teeth, and we divide it by uh, 2.5, okay, uh, teeth. per inch, okay, and this gives me a six inch diameter uh, gear for the 15 tooth. Well, while I'm here, um, you know, this is for the 15 tooth gear, so I'll put little 15 down like this. What's my pitch diameter for the 29 tooth gear? Okay. You do the same thing, you just put a 29 up here. Okay, and that ends up calculating to 11.6 inches. Okay, well, how does that information help us? Right, so these are two diameters. If we add them together and divide by two, that gives us the sum of the radius values from center to center. The other way you can think about that is you can take one of them divided by two and add the other one divided by two, but mathematically that's the same thing, right? So we can just say uh, center distance Okay, is going to be equal to 6 inches plus 11.6 inches over 2. Okay, and what that ends up giving us is 8.8 .8 inches. All right, so that's the resulting center distance between axes uh, AD and BC. So just to kind of remind us where those are, uh, this was axis AD right here, and this is axis BC. All right. The next thing we're supposed to find is the number of teeth that we need for the ring gear. Okay, so here's what we need to do. We need to see that right now we have this length right here, right? This was 8.8 .8 inches. If I want to figure out the overall radius of my ring gear, I need to add what? half of the pitch diameter of a 29 tooth. And remember, C is also 29 teeth. And so I add to it half of 11.6, right? So this right here is 11.6 inches over two. And that gives me the radius of the ring gear. But I probably want the diameter of the ring gear. So say this, diameter 
And that's again the pitch diameter, uh, and I'll just put here the ring, okay, is just going to be equal to 8.8 .8 inches plus, uh, let's see, 11.6 inches over 2, and all of this times 2. which gives me 29.2 inches. Okay, but what the problem asked for was, um, it asked me to find the, let's see, number of teeth necessary for the ring gear. All right, so to do that, I used the, the uh, diametral pitch value again. So we know that we have 29.2, uh, and so I just take that and multiply by 29.2 inches and multiply it by 2.5 teeth per inch. And this gives me the number of teeth that I have for the ring. Okay, and the numbers here work out really nice to where it turns out to be a whole number. All right, does that always happen? What do you do if that doesn't happen? For this problem, let's say you worked all this out and I'd given you different numbers and you came up with a number and let's say the number turned out to be 74.6 teeth. Okay, you don't actually, you don't have to do that um, typically. Typically adding like, if at least if you have a large enough number of teeth, adding the little fractional bit to make it a little bit larger is okay. One of the reasons for this is that another property we haven't talked about for involute teeth, involute teeth, that shape of the tooth is actually, uh, it's not very sensitive to center dis distance, all right? So you can actually, you know, when I say that, you still want to get your center distances pretty close to right, but they can forgive a little bit of uh, discrepancy in terms of center distance of the teeth by using an involute tooth shape. It will maintain, uh, you know, your line of contact fairly well. The only downside of relying on that is that if you are really close to one for a contact ratio and you start to pull your, your teeth apart from each other, one of the effects that that has is it tends to further reduce your contact ratio, okay? So you, you want to make sure that the teeth maintain uh, relatively close. But if you have a little bit, of, little bit to spare in terms of contact ratio, it's okay to... Uh, let something like this ring value move up to the next larger integer for number of teeth. Um, one other thing that I will say here uh, also is that uh, we do know for this problem that all of these gears need to be full circle gears because we're going to plan on running this thing, you know, kind of in a continuous fashion. Um, there are examples that you can see out there of gears where you don't need to run them in full circles. And when that's the case, you no longer have to constrain yourself to uh, whole numbers of teeth, all right? The reason we need a whole number of teeth is that we need the gear to be able to rotate continuously. As soon as you have something that says the gear doesn't need to rotate continuously, then you can effectively build gears that have fractional numbers of teeth um, not physically, but in terms of like the number of, the, the, for the size of it, if that makes sense. You can, you can change and you can have fractional numbers of teeth um, if, you, if you don't need them to turn all the way around. All right, so there's my uh, number of teeth necessary for the ring gear. Now, for this last part, the last part of the problem says the number of turns of shaft A for each turn of shaft D. This is a gear ratio, okay? This is another way of kind of describing the gear ratio that happens for this entire gear train. Um, many uh, kinematics kind of textbooks, and I believe they have some stuff in here as well, 
They, they give you ways that you can uh, do this a little bit more formulaically, but I'll just tell you that the formulas for these types of questions tend to confuse me a lot, and I end up getting the wrong answer a lot, you know, because they, they tend to be co confusing. That may just be a failing on my part, but I'll tell you that I figured a workaround a long time ago when I was in school, and I wanted to share that with you, and I don't see very many, if any, textbooks present it this way, but it works, and it's, it's sound, okay? It's a, it's a reasonable way to do it. What I'm gonna do is instead of trying to do this with just ratios of teeth, I'm gonna look at this from a more of a uh, kinematics, dynamics kind of a standpoint. And if you do that, then you don't have to do things as much like, like count the teeth. So that's what I'm gonna try to do here. All right, that would have been a hard thing for me to draw quickly, so I went ahead and put it in here. This is a bigger picture of what we are actually dealing with, okay? And uh, what we are doing here is we are essentially saying that we have a ring gear here on the outside. I don't really need an arrow here because the ring gear is held stationary. Okay, so the ring gear is on the outside. Gear A is shown here in the middle. That's typically, that type of a gear is usually called the sun in the sun and planet kind of a gear setup. And then we have the planet that's connected to this arm that goes up there. And, um, and then the output is actually the speed of the arm that extends from point A to point B. Okay, so this is a representation of the same thing we started with up there at the top. All right. Um, there's a big, big concept that came out of your, probably from your dynamics class, and that big concept is the idea of instantaneous center of zero velocity. Did any of you talk about that when you were in dynamics? Okay. There's a lot of ways that instantaneous, here's kind of the idea of it in case anyone's kind of, you know, doesn't remember that very well or anything. On a body, if you can, t if you can say what the velocity is at one point. So let's say I've got a velocity here. I don't know, I'm going to make it go like this. So let's somehow I know that the velocity on, on this body at one point goes in that direction. And let's say that somehow I know that the velocity on this same body, you know, goes in this direction. Okay, so two different points on the same rigid body, two different velocities. And uh, what I'm going to try to do then is say, do I know at this instant in time where I know these two velocities at this instant, can I tell where the center of rotation is for this body? All right. And how do you do that? Do you remember that? Right. So you create perpendicular lines. So you, you, uh, you know, you would create a line maybe like this, perpendicular to that. Um, velocity, and then you'd create another line perpendicular to this velocity. And wherever those lines intersect, at this instant in time, we know that is the, at this point in time, this is the instantaneous center of zero velocity, instantaneous center of rotation. Okay. Um, and that's useful in a lot of different ways. We can sometimes use it backwards, though. So we, if we know for a system of bodies like this, if we know where a point uh, of zero velocity is for a body, then we know what the velocity profile is relative to that point. Okay, so imagine here, you know that one point is not moving at all, and you know the velocity at another point. You can set up what the velocity is anywhere in that body based on knowing those two values. Okay, and here's why I bring that up. Do we know any points in this system that have zero velocity? So where, do, where does it look like has zero velocity? Okay, zero velocity at the center of point of A. So there, I would agree there's no translation happening at the center point of A. Anywhere else? Shaft, center point of shaft D. Okay, yeah, we, that's another... That one also, it's kind of at the same point relative to the, you know, the view that we have here. Okay. 
The one that is harder for people to see typically is the point of interface between that uh, planet gear right there and the ring gear. Why do I know that has zero velocity at this instant? Okay. It's because the ring gear is stationary. And we're assuming that that gear is not slipping relative to the ring gear. So, you know, this whole thing, this whole assembly of gears B and C, it's not like the whole thing is at zero velocity, but right there at that point of interface, it's got zero velocity. Okay? Well, is that something we can use at all? Perhaps, okay? That, I would agree that perhaps we can use that. Let me show you kind of the process I think of here. So this is the first one. Let's say that somehow we know the velocity omega d, all right? So let's just say that that's something that we know. If we know omega d, could we figure out the instantaneous velocity of point b? Okay, how do those relate to each other? So this right here, I'll call it v sub b. And I already have specified that I have omega d for the angular velocity of that arm. So v sub b would be what? Omega d times, and a lot of you probably uh, don't have that fresh in your mind, but remember that was 8.8 .8 inches uh, as far as the center distance from you know, the center axis of gear A relative to the center axis of gear B. Okay? Well, here's what I want to show you with that. Once you know that that's the velocity of point B, and you know, because, you know, that's the point right here, you also know that this has zero velocity right here, it means you can set up a linear relationship along this line that goes right here, right? you can look at any point within here and you can know what the velocity is. Right? If you remember, that's kind of how the idea of instantaneous center of rotation, if you know the center, you can just draw a line like that and you get faster and faster and faster the further and further away that you go. Well, what point do you think I might be especially interested in? Okay, some of you, I, I, don't, I don't know if it kind of makes sense, but remember part B and part C, those are all one part, right? They're connected to each other. If you remember all the way back at the beginning, um, you know, that's one shaft that connects through that whole thing. And so if I can figure out the uh, speed, the linear speed of this interface between gear B and gear A, that might be a useful thing to me. Well, this, this uh, setup allows me to do that, right? I can go ahead and imagine this, right? You set up the slope of that line basically because you know what the, the linear speed is of B given uh, omega D. And now you can extend that line out and find, I called that point E. We could maybe call this V sub E, okay? And because gear B and gear A mate with each other right there, they have the same linear velocity at this instant in time. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and figure that out. So VE Okay, this is going to be equal to VB times what you think? Okay. Well, let's go back and remember some of our lengths, right? So what was the length from here to here? 11.6 inches over two. And what would the length be from here to here? Okay. 
I might have to go back up here and remember the diameter of gear B. Okay, gear B, did we have that yet? Yeah, six inches, okay. So that means this has a three inch radius, all right? So this is basically 11.6 inches plus three inches. All right, so if I'm trying to figure out E, I can just take the ratio of those two lengths, right, and multiply by uh, VB. So it ends up giving me 11.6 inches plus 3 inches over 11. Uh, I may have, this is supposed to be over 2, right? Sorry. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, so what I'm basically doing is saying that the ratio, I'm setting up some, uh, some ratios for two similar triangles here. There's a triangle here, and there's another triangle that goes out to here. And what I'm basically saying is, if I want to find that velocity at E, I can take velocity at B and multiply by the ratio of, you know, the length of one, the side of one of those triangles divided by the side of the other triangle. Does that make sense? All right, so that gives me the velocity of point E. Is there anything I can do with that? So omega A then becomes VE over the radius of that um, gear, which again was 11. Uh, 0.6 inches over 2. All right, so I've got this set up in a kind of a chain of relationships. Now I can put all those together and figure out what my ratio is for the overall uh, gear train. The reason, by the way, I can do this is that, you know, there's a velocity relationship from this you know, piece back to my zero point back here. And that's for gear A. Anyway. All right. So let me put plug these in. Um, let's see now. Omega A. Let's just go ahead and start substituting things in. Omega A would be equal to VB times 11.6 inches over 2 plus 3 inches over 11.6 inches over 2, okay, over 11.6 inches over 2. All right, and then I plug in my value for V sub B. So let me do that right here. So instead of V sub B, I plug in omega D times 8.8 .8 inches. Okay, and if I divide both sides by omega D, that gives me omega A over omega D. And I won't punch all that in, but it gives me 2.302. Okay, and let's make sure I have this right. The number of turns of shaft A for each turn of shaft D. Okay, so I think that's what that gives me there, right? If you wanted it the other way, you could take the reciprocal, right? If you wanted to know the, the inverted relationship there. So anyway, maybe this helps you. I'll just say that trying to memorize the equations that are in, in some of the books I've seen with respect to knowing these relationships in epicyclic gear trains, uh, I haven't been very successful with that in my life. And do, using technique like this 
has pretty much always worked and done me good. Uh, and so I wanted to show it to you in case it's not something you would have thought of yourself. So anything else that uh, you want to know about? All right. Well, then I am going to let my voice rest for a few minutes and uh, I will see you guys on Friday. <laughs>